Everybody, welcome to my latest YouTube video. This is a, this is a, a very amazing one. Um, if you are a lower angler, and especially if you're a jerkbait fisherman, um, there's one person in the um, world that you think about, and it's the man who brought jerkbait fishing back to the forefront, and especially on top end. I mean, top end, world class finishes. Tonight's interviews with Joe Peterson from True Glide. Um, I've I've never really met Joe. Um, I've I've messaged him before and stuff like that. He's a top man. You know, he's a really really nice guy. He owns a company called True Glide. It's based in Minnesota in uh, America, and he makes some of the best lures out there. I'll, there'll be some some you know I'll put some examples up here somewhere like that so you can see some of them and uh, and I'll put a link in the description below. Right now I'm going to bring him into talk now. I've just had ten minutes with him. I could have, I could have talked to him for two hours. It'd be bored stiff after this. So what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring him in now to chat. He's an amazing guy. Get ready. Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, after an introduction like that, I'm just going to go. We're not, you don't need anything after that. Did what you hear that? that? <laughs> doing no, great. Did you actually hear that? I hope not. I hope not. So Joe, right. Most important thing is, right, introduce yourself, tell them what company you do, what you own, and explain who you are. Sure. Yeah. So, Joe Peterson. Um, I own a company called True Glide. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with, like, high-end um, hand-built baits, that's kind of my gig. So, I make um, high-end baits, uh, mostly of wood. I do rubber baits. Uh, kind of do a little bit of everything as well. Um, kind of got lucky um, that I came in at the right time of making baits, you know, the handmade stuff had kind of really started tamping off a little bit uh, 15, 16 years ago, uh, 17 years ago, I guess, when I really started doing it. Um, and the niche was there and I really like high-end baits and no one was making them, so I decided to do it myself, right? Yep. And so uh, anyway, I kind of filled that niche. Now there's a plethora of great builders to choose from, which is freaking awesome in my opinion. Yep. Um, and so in addition to making the handmade lures, I also um, make an epoxy called True Coat which you might not know that much about. But, know, um, yeah. yeah, and so um, we formulated an epoxy from the ground up for lure making. It's never been done before. All the lures out there uh, previous to True Coat were using um, top, bar top um, coatings, marine coatings and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And it was quite a bit of work and worse than that, but it's quite a bit of work to make it look good, I should say. Um, and worse than that, it's really bad for your health. We have some yeah. amazing lure builders um, get really sick and some pass away uh, oh. that are doctors attributed to the epoxy. Yeah. And so um, I formulated that epoxy now going back probably six years or so ago. So I own True yeah. Coat as well. Yeah. Uh, and then on top of that too, um, I have the the pleasure of working with CWC and Strike Pro. Yeah. Um, I do consulting with them. We have a line out of uh, True Glide baits, which I'm sure you're going to link some pictures, but um, you know, the Guppy is probably yeah. the most uh, popular one. Um, but I cherish that relationship I have with them too. And yeah. so got a few different things going on. I also own a small clothing company called Breaker here in the States. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, t-shirts and hats and stuff like that too. Yep. I do a little bit of everything. It's all fishing related, but. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. Right. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go, I'm going to start with the questions from the, from the lower builds at UK. I've, I've just had a quick discussion about this and all different guys who make clothes at UK. And uh, we are extremely lucky. You know, there's some really talented guys out there. I know you know a couple of them already. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you these questions first, and then we'll get on with the proper questions. These, the, you don't know, you don't know what these are going to be. So I can only apologize if they're rude. I, I, like I say, I don't really know. So first one's, um, an English, an English guy who's moved up to Scotland, a guy called Graham Slater. He's a brilliant bloke. 
uh, makes fantastic lows. Been making them for donkey's years, yeah. probably for himself mainly when he first started, but then he started to sell them. And I've got a few of his lows here. Really nice guy. Uh, and I'll put some examples of his lows up on screen so you can see him. They'll cover my ugly mug. Right. What he said, and I hope you understand this, uh, on a new bait, how much weight and how do you distribute it on a brand new lure? How do, oh, so I think what um, he's asking is how do I decide how to weight it? Yes. Okay. And how, how, do, how do you distribute the weight? Yeah. Um, so um, I don't want to go into too much detail because it'll bore your bore Absolutely. Your well, no, no, yeah. that, but it might also tell everybody on earth how you, how you make lures. That, there's that too. Uh, that yeah. I'm less concerned about. People figure things yeah. out. It's, it's fine with me. Um, you know, it depends on what I want the lure to do. Yeah. And so, you know, I make mostly jerk baits, glide baits, yeah. we call them here in the States, but I make a lot of top waters and I make crank baits. I make a little bit of everything. Yeah. And so it really depends on what action I want to get out of that lure. In general, I'll do a lot of ballast weighting. So most of my glide baits are a little bit different than most guys. I do a yeah. technique called zipper weighting. So it'll yeah. be like 15 small weights and one large weight. Yeah. Uh, and where you position the larger weight is what gives the bait the action. Okay. And so um, depending if I want to tight glide to it, like the guppy has a tighter yeah. glide in my opinion, a further glide um, or you know something else in between, that pivot point is what dictates what makes the lure do what it does. Oh, okay. And so depending on what I want, I kind of start with that. If I want a glider and I want it to be a you know something of a tighter action, I'll move that way closer to the fulcrum point. So okay. I, I go way detail on this one, but that you know, is, I mean I mean, obviously, I've um, I've taken some of my cobs literally down to wood. They've caught so many fish. I mean, I'm talking bare wood, yeah. where even some of the weights are starting to hang out. And I remember seeing for the first time when I rubbed one down to clean it to to re have it repainted. I don't do it myself. I, I, I wouldn't trust myself. Um, and I've rubbed it down. I've looked at the weights, and I'm thinking, how the hell has he sussed out how to put those weights in that order? <laughs> You know, and, and I think that's a big thing. I'm I'm quite an arty guy. I'm actually quite good at that sort of stuff. I'm really, you know, I'm quite craft oriented, and I've I have made my own lure, and it ended up like an house brick. I mean, <laughs> I never read out the wrong right word, and it, and it, it was like a house brick. You know, it worked, but it, it turned. You know, when you get it wrong, and it literally turns on itself like yeah. that. It was garbage. Um, but yeah. I, how much weight goes into them. I mean, so do, do you literally know when you place those weights, yes, that's going to work perfectly? Or do you, do you stick them on first, try it, then put them in place? Well, I, I think I'm at the point now, I've been doing it for a long time. I have a, I have a pretty informed opinion of where the weights are going to go when I start. Okay. So yeah. nowadays, a lot of times I can look at it and I'll know from the shape, you know, yeah. high back or a low bottom, something in between. You kind of yeah. know what how that's going to affect the movement in the water. Okay. Um, so, but when I first started, it was, let's just drill a bunch of holes, pour some lead in it, and let's see what happens, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think like yeah. everybody. And the, yeah. thing, the thing with that is it's, you know, that's where you get these baits that, um, uh, let me backtrack. The world today is so tight-knit, and people can get information so fast, oh. things start to look homogenized, right? So yeah. baits start to look the same. Yeah. Um, people like something, so they take that part, and it, it just all kind of looks oh. the same or works the same. Yeah. Um, where you really get those unique baits. So the guys who are like, I don't know, let's throw it the wall and try it out. And yeah, yeah, so um, sometimes you do have to do weird weighting to check it out. I've recently gone back to one of my standard baits and I redid the weighting because I wasn't super happy with the way it was working. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll see what people think about that. I mean, uh, I'm sure guys are going to notice and be like, wait a second, this is a further glide now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I, I do usually know when I'm looking at it now, what's going to happen, where the weight should go and how it's going to work. But I didn't always. I mean, no one does, right? So brilliant. I mean, do you, do you literally test every single lure? No lure will leave your workshop unless you are one hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Every lure's done in the water multiple times by the time you you buy it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And then uh, what happens if one's not right? Do you do you literally just say right? I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that to one side, or does it go in the bin, or do you literally restart it all again that bait and reweight it? I have a restart bin that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. And so I always intend to take them back down and rebuild them. Sometimes yeah. I do, but usually I just kind of move on and to the next thing. The do, funny do, thing do, is a lot of times I'll put them aside and I'll come back to them yeah. and they'll look great. You know, I'm sure you've had that. You're like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. For me. yeah. And so those, those baits usually go in my box. And so yeah. um, when I'm fishing, you, you know, I catch a lot of big muskies and I yeah. think a lot of it has to, because I've got the baits that are a little bit more idiosyncratic. You know, a little Absolutely. Weird, so. 
It, it's weird you say that. We, um, Squirrely Bert's big in the UK. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, we customize, we all customise myself. The garbage. Yeah. Whoever's in charge of quality control, yeah. are literally, they're, honestly, they're either blind, deaf, or just stupid. They, they haven't a clue. But in the UK, we, we you know, we, we customise them ourselves. We re-weight them ourselves. Yeah. And I've, I've re-weighted loads and loads of Squirrely Bert's for people and myself. And mine run perfect. Yeah. However, the best catches I have are Squirrely Bert's are not the ones that run perfectly straight. Mine are the ones that roll to one side slightly. They will dive, but they'll also roll to one side. And I still, yeah. I am still 100% sure that that little imperfection in the action is what catches. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. 100%. I actually have a theory on that too. We'll go further into bait building here though. A lot of guys like to add like a, um, they'll take a glide bait, right? They'll take like a, a shape kind of like this dude here. They'll take yep. a glide bait. Whoops, there's the camera. And they'll take um, a plastic lip and put it off the back. Yep. And what they're doing with that in a glide bait is they're trying to get a further glide. And I know okay. you and I have talked about the further glide thing. The yeah, one yeah. thing, it, probably, it looks great in the water, but the problem with that stabilizing fin is it takes out all that little weird wobble, the little something different. And yep. I like that. I mean, I, I that's what I think makes the fish bite. Yep. And so there's nothing wrong with adding that to it. But I do think a lot of times guys, they want the bait to look so good to them. And they'll catch fish, yeah. of course. But yeah. it's the little weird stuff like the roll you're talking about oh. or the little pause or the wobble on the drop. It's the yeah. little stuff like that that really yeah. the fish bite, the big fish. End of the day, we make lure. We, uh, the, the, thing, the biggest draw to jerk baits, when I first started, I remember the first time I ever used a jerk bait. I was fishing on Lake Windermere in, in UK, up in Lake District, which is a big, a big expanse of water. Yeah. And I remember we, um, I fished with a lad called Kevin and he took me onto a, a large bay that was surrounded. It was a large bay, two or 300 yards wide, four or 500 yards deep. And I remember it was full of pondagetum, the, the weed growing up, and above it were about 10 foot of clear water. Yeah. And I remember the first time it pulled out um, a trout pan, a rainbow trout, Jack Cobb's countdown, crazy shad. And it, it cast it across, I looked at him, and it cast it across this bay, and it brought it across them about seven different fish attacked it. Before <laughs> right at his feet, a 12 pound pike grabbed it. And I saw it, I saw the action. And the first time I saw that proper walk the dog style, big glide i thought that's this this is me this it, it would just yeah now it, straight away i said i'll tell you what i'll give you one of these lures and he gave me one of the cobs and he says put that on he goes you've got the right outfit for it i've been using crankbaits and stuff like you know big soft plastics he goes, and this is obviously this is in like mid 90s early 90s and i remember i cast this lure across this uh, across this bay and again, I, 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 I couldn't get the action right. You know, when you first start, it's all about the rhythm and, and learning it. And now, years down the line, I could literally fall asleep and still jerk bait fish. I know I've got the rhythm right by the, how much line I'm picking up and the feel of the rod. And I know when I've got to take because I can feel those little tiny, right. you know, that only, only a jerk bait man will let, you know, be able to stand. And I remember that day I said, that's me. That I am a jerkbait fisherman, and I love it. And a good thing I like about it is when you do master jerkbait, when you can get a lump of wood, right, that'll just go left and right. So a perfect jerkbait will go left and right. But when you can start to work that lure so that it looks like an injured fish, or you can work it around structure by shorter taps and longer taps, and you know quarter taps, working on a river on flowing water where you, can, you know you can you can turn it into flow to keep it where it is, and then turn it sideways to run it down swim, and you. That's when you become a proper low fisherman. Anybody can chuck a soft plastic lower. Anybody can chuck a soft plastic and grind and grind and grind and grind, or a, a big buzz bait or a spinner bait and grind. But a jerk bait, a jerk bait fisherman learns the master of how to make a lump of wood in a catch a fish, and that it just blows my mind. I think that's still the best thing about low fishing. Yeah, that's funny. That, that, um, oops, I'm going to touch my phone because my battery just came out. Real. Um, I think that's the thing with with that I love about glide baits and jerk bait fishing is it's you that parts all the action. You know, it's yeah. just a chunk of wood. And yeah. um, for in the States, my, my, in the States, you guys don't have bass, but bass fishermen in the United States, you know, they jig fish and they, they yeah. pitch these little jigs out and they make the fish bite and they do different things with it. And you, that connection from, from your rod and your hand to the bait is there. Yeah. And a lot of times I feel like in musky fishing, specifically pike fishing, it is just chunk and grind. That's great. Yeah. You catch yeah. fish for sure. And I certainly do that. But the yeah. thing with glide bait fishing or jerk bait fishing is it, it's so intimate. It's you and the, you're yeah. making it do what it does, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, I, that's why I love it too. The uh, first time I started glide bait fishing, that's, that was it. Same Your thing. life changed from then on. Yeah.
Yeah, that's it. It gets to you. It gets to you. Right, let me finish these questions because there's quite there's quite a few. Um, when you this might be an unusual one for you, but we've we've sort of like covered this. Uh, when you replicate an action, so you know, if you if you if you're sat sat in bed and you're watching Friends or something like that, something you might be watching at night time, and you like think to yourself, um, I'll tell you what, I want to replicate this action on lower. What what can you literally just think right? I'm gonna I want something to dive and and rise, dive and rise, you know, left and right, left. similar like a suic. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's got a bit of an odd an odd action. Um what do you what makes you think right? I'm gonna make it this action, I'm gonna make that bait look like a bait fish. So like gup is uh, like a, a, a is it a copy of a, a crappy or a, a, yeah. is it just a fish, a fish shape? Yeah, basically. Uh, so a lot of times I'll take my my baits, then kind of informed by classic baits, you know, like classic drop bellies or whatever, okay. and make them my own. But the guppy itself, I really wanted a couple of things when I did design it. I wanted it to be more of a, I don't want to say generic, but I want the shape to replicate a wide swath of different awesome. types of fish species. And yeah, that's not specific. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, the funny thing is, again, I, I, you know, most of my experience with muskie fishing. Um, when I first started, I went back and there's lots of studies done on, on what muskies eat. And um, I remember going back and they, they showed like, you know, this percent is perch, this percent is this, they prefer this shaped body. Um, and when I went to start making my lures, I actually went off of that and thought, okay, well, 80% of their diet or something along those lines are um, soft rate fish or, you know, perch or whatever it might be. And I started designing baits based on that. And they have a different preference for, you know, they have a couple of different preferences. And so I made my lures to fill those preferences that were, were in the um, the studies they had done on contents of musky stomachs. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of how I did my original shape. Yeah. It, obviously, in fly fishing, they say match the hatch. It's exactly yeah. the same as lure fishing. If, if you've got um, fish, the only time I've not known that to work is on trout waters in the UK. On our big natural, on our trout waters where we stock rainbow trout and brown trout. Right. When you, I've used so many brown trout and rainbow trout pattern lures that don't seem to work. And I think sometimes it's the odd thing that's completely different to what they're used to seeing that makes them attack and I don't. And I remember everybody says, when, I, when I've been to trout wars and I've seen people's buckets and they've got hundreds of lures in, I look down and they're all trout patterns and I'm like thinking, I hope it isn't just me that thinks that this, this ain't quite right. And I mean, I have caught the odd pike on trout patterns in on trout waters, but most of them have come in gory colors. Your bright oranges, your bright yellows, pinks, and your, you know, your, your ivies is maybe something really glitter, silver glitter. So it, it, I could I can understand what you're saying about the, you know, what, what the musky are eating and, and matching the hatch. It, it, it completely makes sense, but there's just every so often really odd situation that don't add up, and that's one of them. When you think that all that, all that pike are eating, I mean, they get big, you know, our, our British pike in trout waters go a mid 40, 45 pounds, right. you know, the big fish. And um, all they're doing is eating big dead trout or live trout. Right. That, that's yeah. all they eat all day. That's all they eat all day. Then they're used to seeing them. They're used to seeing them flapping in water. They used to see them getting played by fly anglers. And right. so that's the only time I've ever seen it where it doesn't match. Other times, if you're fishing a roach water and you use a roach silver pattern, it catches pike. Right. And yeah. if you if you're on a perch water that catch you know there's pike in a perch water if you use a perch lower you're going to catch pike it's it, right. it works it's weird it's weird that's the thing about low fishing that gets us all you, right. you just never know you never know yeah well and you think about it here we throw a lot of these big double bladed um, spinner baits you know that look like nothing yeah they look like nothing but it's the vibration yeah. of the blades that awesome. that trigger their their lateral yeah. line you know and yeah. And talk about not matching any hats at all. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, 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 that, that's a prime example, absolute prime example. You know, even um, when when you look at when you look at a spinner bait and you think that looks like nothing, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing you're replicating. A, a lot of time, I think um, I think pike have two state. This is my own personal preference. It might it might be my own. I think pike have two feeding spells. They they have, they have three spells. They have rest when they're not feeding. Yeah. They'll have time when they're actively feeding. And then there's times when they're in between, and if something comes past, they're having it anyway. So right. they're not hunting fish, but if something like a spinnerbait goes above them, it actually, because it's in their space, more of a, um, a territorial attack rather than a feeding right. attack. Right. And and sometimes to me, those when you get hooked on the side of the face, when you've got a lot of pike hooked on the side of the face, and, and probably muskies too, I think it's more more to do with them um, being a territorial take than being an actual feeding take. That, that's my own personal opinion on it, Joe. I'm not oh, sure yeah, what you think. For sure. You know, the funny thing is, you know, muskies, 
where I live, the water's crystal clear. I mean, you can yep. see down, you know, 30 feet in some spots. Yep. And so, and muskies follow, right? And so you can see a big muskie, like this guy is 54 and a half inches. Yeah. We saw him Extremely follow, impressive. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Big one. And um, so you can see the fishing and see how they're reacting. And the number of times that you, I've had muskies on top water specifically, they're following the bait, nose to the bait, and they're following it, mouth closed, and they yeah. shake their head like this to scare it. They're, they think the top yeah, like, is territory. Go away. Mm, yeah, they're, yeah, yeah. You know, they're not eating it. Their mouth's open. They move their heads to splash water, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's strictly just territorial. Where I yeah. think pike are a little bit more interesting is uh, muskies do school, but it's not like pike. And I yeah. feel like sometimes pike, you can get them to start eating if you find a school because yeah. you can get that whole competition thing going, and you can start them feeding. We don't yeah. have that, which we did. <laughs> But I've yeah. seen it. There is a video where there's a pair of fifties caught together. I've seen. I've seen. I mean, I've watched some American. I've seen some American yeah. Canadian videos on musky yeah. fishing, and you're so lucky. You are so so lucky to have fish like that. And seeing a fifty pound musky take a lure, and, and it's like, and then there's one on a live bait. I think one like catches one on a live bait on a sucker. Yeah. Another oh, yeah. like catches one on a lure, and there's a pair of fifties in net at the same time. You're like. A fifty-inch musky is just like what's your what's your PB? Is that your PB behind you? Fifty-four? No, yeah. no, that one I won a tournament on, and that was the trophy they gave us a replica. No, wow. this one's fifty-four and a half. Yeah, you can see like I put my hand next so you can see a little bit better. It's a big fish. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a big fish. fish. Uh, my biggest is fifty-six, so I've got wow. a, a much bigger fish than this. Real fact earth. Um, yeah. One day maybe I'll make a replica, but it's not really my. I'd, I'd rather have the memory. <laughs> make yeah, sense. absolutely. Yeah. Fifty-six inch. Wow, that's yeah. ridiculous. Right, we're going to move on to another lure builder now, a lad called Dave Greenwood. Now, Dave's again, he has a company called DG Lures. And again, he's he's a big lure fisherman, big uh, Windermere man. You know, he's fished in Lake District a lot. He's a man, man, uh, Manchester man. Uh, and he's he's made quite a lot of lures, different lures as well, jerk baits, uh, pull baits, uh, tail baits, a bit of all sorts. And That's he's asked me he's asked me a couple of things. He says, which airbrush do you use? Oh, well, I am, a, I am a, an Iwata fan. So I happen to be at my painting station right now. So okay. I like Iwata. I mean, I, I do mostly the um, the HPC plus are my okay. my go to, yeah. uh, unless I'm doing base coating and then I go through the big dogs. But yeah. um, all Iwata stuff. And I've got you know I've got uh, one two eight of them hooked up right now, and they're all the same. A lot of guys will, except for my my um, I've got a couple of big ones for laying down base coats. Okay. Uh, but all the other ones are the same, so that I I can just buy the needles and the um the nozzles and stuff the parts okay. for them i can yeah. just buy them easier so they just interchange because i'm really yeah. rough on them um dave will probably see this but i don't use a cap on my um on the tip which way on the tip yeah here. okay i don't use a protector um because i get finer lines that way and, yeah. but that makes me destroy needles like crazy <laughs> and so now the, there's probably a group of lure makers now at uk are looking and going Oh my God, that's yeah. amazing. I live trying to clue what you're talking about, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> you know, I, I understand that you're airbrush and I've seen people doing it, but I mean, that's proper technical. And, and the guys who are going to be watching this are probably going to be lower guys and they'll they'll understand it. Anyone who's tried it themselves. Okay. My my um, airbrush I use is called an aerosol cam. And I just <laughs> right. spray it, I spray it four foot away and just do it that way. But listen, we all started somewhere. Surely you yeah. must have started with an aerosol once. I'm sorry. Did you start with an aerosol? Yeah, like for a, sure. Out of a can? Yeah, matter of fact, hang on. I've, I've got because I'm at my here's my very first uh baits I made. Oh, wow, these are all done. These are the first uh musky baits I made. Now, these are going yeah. back 1990, I don't know, way back there before yeah. I started selling them. But um, so that that's this is the very first one. All wow. done with that's your very salt. first ever jerk bait you made, very first ever, yeah. Wow. And this is uh one I made the same day in a perky kind of pattern, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was all that was all. That's how that and that's how it all starts, and that's that, that was the first two baits you ever made. First that's year, fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, his other question was, what paint do you use? I make my own paint, so I'll use um, I'll use some paint like whites and blacks and those yeah. kind of um, base coat colors or something. I go through a lot of that. Are just yeah. not really doesn't make sense to make them. I'll buy those and I'll use Wicked paint usually. Okay. You guys will know what that is. Yeah. Um, Create text color. Uh, yeah. Other than that, though, I, I get a base, a clear base. Um, not, well, I can't it's way over there. I'll grab it. But okay. I get a clear base, and then I get pigments, and I make my own paints. So, and um, that's where you get your, that's where you get individual colors that nobody else can literally make, unless you can you've got formula. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and some colors are pretty close to colors you 
you can probably buy colors really close to what I'm making. Yeah, yeah. But I like that. Um, I like making my but own. Your colors. Yeah, yeah. And the thing, yeah, the yeah. funny thing is, a lot of guys collect my lures, and so <laughs> it's kind of funny because I once I make a lure, it's gone. I'm like, if someone buys it, it's yours. I don't care what you do with it. I yeah. made it specifically for you, you know. And yeah. so I don't really keep tabs on my stuff. And I'll make it, and the minute I make a bait, I hate it. And I'll be honest with you, I make it. I'm like, oh, I could have done better, you know. <laughs> and so. Um, guys will have these heated discussions on how much pigment I used one year versus the next year on the paints I made. And I'm like, oh, really? I mean, I've had guys tell me that, you know, for example, oh, in 2010, you switched up your pigment to so-and-so. I'm like, oh yeah, I did. How'd you know, how'd you know that? So it's kind of funny, like guys really pay attention to, um, they really pay attention to some of that stuff that I don't. That's, that's <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, obviously you've got, you'll have uh, collectors so you'll have collectors in states that literally just literally buy true glides or they'll buy as many as they can. Who's got the most? Do you know? Do you know who's got the most in in oh, the world? Yeah. Apart from yourself. Yeah, I've got a um, my my number one fan, I guess you say, or just a great guy, great collector. Um, his name is Joe Signitti. He um, is in New York. I mean, I, he's got more than I. I didn't know I made that many lures. He told me once how many he has. I can't really recall, but I know he has a room. Yeah. Um, and, but the cool thing about him is he's um, he's probably one of the world's foremost vintage lure collectors. That's okay. what he does for a living. And he writes books and stuff like that, too, um, or my understanding. And so um, it's pretty humbling and honored. I'm totally honored that he collects my lures. I mean, the stuff this guy's got, I mean, his lures that are, I mean, we talk about, you know, 50 pounds for some lures, $200 for some of mine. Yeah. He's got lures that are worth $60,000 vintage wow. ones. So, um, but he's definitely... He's definitely the guy, but I have quite a few collectors all over the place. I've got a couple yeah. in England. I've got a couple, you know, I've got quite a few in Europe. Yeah, um, yeah so they're yeah. kind of spread out. But uh, Joe is the the king. I've mentioned this to a few people, and a few people say I've got I've got a couple of those. I, I mean, I'm a poor I'm a poor Yorkshireman with 15 kids. I've, you know, I can't be affording all those. <laughs> but listen, kids, listen but... No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> well, I don't think so. Don't tell wife. I've got one due in oh, next yeah, week right. actually. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love my custom laws and, and, you know, I've seen true glides going about internet and price and it's like, what? Wow, it's just, I remember we had a conversation about musky snacks earlier on and I remember I paid 90 pounds to have a, a jointed perch made by, um, by Mike. And, yeah. uh, uh, and I also got a, another a pike jerk bit and that were 90 pound. So like yeah. 100, nearly 200 pound in, in two lures. And I remember I speak about that now and people go, you are absolutely off your head. And especially because I use them lures. You know, yeah. I actually yeah. physically use them lures. Those lures are, 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 are unbelievable. And you know, you know, Mike, you know, he, he used to make lures yeah. and stuff. And um, when, when you see a proper quality ampule, it's just, there's, there's something special about it, but they, they are there to be used. They are there to be used. You know, every one of y'all who you, you'd make, do you know how many of them actually used? Just people to say, right, I'm putting that on a shelf and I'm going to put a little security alarm around it so it never, nobody ever steals it. Yeah, yeah. I would say, um, I don't know for sure, of course, right? But yeah. a lot of guys fish them and um, a lot of tournaments been won on them. You know, sorry, I've okay. won quite a few myself. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah um, so a lot of tournaments been done really well on my lures. I skip pictures all the time of guys catching fish on them. Um, yeah. I would say that now uh, for there was when I first started, everyone fished them. They were forty dollars, you know, seventeen years ago, okay. and it was high end, but it wasn't out of the price range where people would fish them. That was the price for a custom lure. Okay. And um, a lot of people fished them. And they're still fishing those lures, so they're getting yeah. rarer and rarer to have those yeah. early year ones because they're getting pretty hacked up. And then it came a time where the price point went up a little bit, and more collectors started collecting. I started getting a name, and they started yeah. collecting. And I'd say probably half the people collected, and half the people fished. Now yeah. we're kind of this, this I like to call it the golden age of bait making, and hopefully it's going to get platinum, right? But, Absolutely. Um, yeah, right now, um, my price point starting, you know, where I start them at, it's not outrageous. I mean, that's that's the price point for a good handmade lure in the States. There's lures more yeah. expensive than mine starting. Now, some yeah. of my really custom stuff goes for a lot, I know, and that's yeah. probably going pure just collectors. Um, but now to spend that much money, I think people are fishing them. Uh, people yeah. are fishing a lot of them, actually. And so, um, which is good for me because I spend most of my time, the paint jobs are fun, but the vast yeah, yeah, majority of time going to the weighting, the sanding, the carving, everything else to make that lure work. Like that's the art to me is to make the lure work the way I want to work. Yeah. You know, so I'm glad people are fishing them again a lot. Brilliant.
Um, do, while we're while we're talking about, do you know I've I've got all these questions to ask you. What we spoke about earlier on, and I'm almost in two minds to scrap them and just talk just talk rubbish like this. It's fantastic. Yeah, 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 um, we'll the we, actually we were talking earlier about price. Just uh, your ba uh, basic loan is two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we were talked about your most expensive lower that's ever been sold. How yeah. much did you get for that lower? I, did, it, was it an auction? Yeah, it was an auction. Uh, recently, it was one thousand seven hundred fifty dollars for, for one bed. I personally got. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's been some auctions for like good charity events and stuff. Where I know one went for five thousand, but that was for, that was a charity event. That was money going to something. Um, you know, that person put money out there more. For good, yeah, for a, absolutely good cause. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a lot of money for a lure. But yeah. listen, if you are a collector and you, you're you're a connoisseur of lure fishing and you don't own one of them lures, then you'll never you'll never understand and appreciate. In life, I think um, everything's worth what people want to pay for it. That, yeah. You know, that pen to some people is worth 50 pence. But if you want a blue pen with that little blue writing on there, you'll pay pound fifty for it. And right. that's exactly what it is. If you make something specific, especially if you almost design something for somebody. I mean, yeah. do, you, do you put people's names in it and stuff? Can you literally... Is that as customized as you do, or do you make a standard bait and say that's what it is? I can't customize it, put your name on it and a picture of your wife in it or anything like that. Yeah, I don't do that anymore. When I first started, I did do quite a bit of that. Okay. But um, you know, when I first started, I had a full time career, you know, and it was just I would do this at nights on weekends when I could. Yeah. I left that career last year, so that's yeah. fortunate. I can probably do a little more of that now. But yeah, um, no, for me, um, I want to do it on my time. I feel like when I make a lure for someone, uh, the I don't know, my artistic expression, I hate to say it that way, has been limited. And so okay. I don't really do that. Um, okay. I, everything's signed and dated. Um, yeah. For me, it's more about, here's what I want to do. And uh, the thing with that is it makes some, um, you know, every year I might not, you know, a perch color bait, for example. Yeah. I've, I've made a perch color bait up to, I think last year I started making some again. I don't know how long. You know, I just stopped. I didn't want to do it. I had painter's block. I'm like, eh. You know, like, you, yeah, that's it. What I want to yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what keeps the creative ju juices going for me. So I can start thinking of some weird colors or thinking of a new bait. And so yeah. I don't really do, I don't do custom, I guess, to yeah. say. I don't do um, four individuals per se. And if you're lucky, yeah, I suppose that, that's where um, you're probably because you're also collectible because they are very, all very, very similar. All the, you know, if you make a batch, so you, would you make like 10 in a batch and then sell that 10? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's so, it. yeah. So usually that's exactly right. So usually what I'll do is I'll, uh, make a pretty big batch for shows because I usually yep. sell show, uh, awesome. shows, uh, yep. and I'll make a big batch and I'll sit down and go, okay, well, what colors do I want to do, you know? And and um, okay, I just I don't look at any of my other colors for the most part. So if you look at like again perch, if you look at my perches over the year, they're all different. I'm like, yeah. I think this is what I did last time, you know? And I yeah, like yeah. better this way. But um, yeah, I'll do ten of that color, and and I've got you know twenty different shapes out there now, yeah. and so you might not even get. A color in one of the shapes I make, and that's kind of what makes them collectible too. Well, because, you know, yeah. I yeah. don't think about that when I'm making them, but I just yeah. go, okay, here's what I've got. I'm going to paint these guys up for now. You yeah. So. And, and when you put them up for sale, do you have people? Do you have a waiting list, or are they sold before they're actually made? Do you just put? No, no. If well, you go to a show, do people literally just make a beeline for True Glide and go, yeah. right? I'm having. I want that one. I want that one. Is, is it people fighting and that sort of? Is that how how yeah, big it is? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's wow. how it is. Wow. The funny thing is, up to this year was, was my first full time year that I planned yeah. to do it. We had quite a few shows lined up, um, yeah. but last year there was a fight in my booth, and they knocked my booth over. I mean, we we sold a lot of lures, and I, I'm not exaggerating at all. I actually had a couple of people helping me. Yeah. It was 30 seconds; every lure is gone off the shelf, and wow. so you know it's cash. It was like a you know like some a scene from some like Wall Street movie. Cash in yeah, the air. Yeah. yeah, I never want to do that again. But. Um, yeah, literally, they, they pushed my booth over, and the guy who had the booth behind me, because of the way the shows are, if you share a partition. Yeah, yeah, of course. Had, yeah, yeah, TV set on his partition. I was wall. Yeah. And it fell over. I, just, I paid for it. He said, don't worry about it, but I bought a new TV set for or gave, I bought a bunch of stuff from him to buy a new TV set. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, you, um, you can't believe that happens, but that literally is how popular bits have become. Crazy. Yeah, and so now what do we do is we, we make a line. Everyone has to queue up. We let okay. one person in the booth at a time. Security. A certain amount of lures. And if you want more than that, you can get to the back of the line. If I don't sell out, you'll have another shot. Uh, yeah. And it hasn't really happened. Usually people buy their max and they go. But, well, like, like we, we were talking about earlier, and you said that when you do sell bait, some people buy them off you for, let's say, I don't know, $500. And then they will literally sell them on again 
for double profit. So people oh, are making yeah. money off your off your lures, which I, if if it, that were me, I'd hate that. That that would be one of the hardest things because to yourself, you think to yourself, if I can if I can sell it to him for five hundred and he's making he's making five hundred, why don't I just sell it for a thousand and cut the middleman out and yeah. sell it to him? You know, it, yeah. it, it must that must be hard part. It doesn't, you know, anyone who makes fishing lures, custom lures, we discuss this all the time. Yeah. The funny thing is, I worked retail my whole life. I yeah. used to oversee, uh, I used to work for a company and we were retail. So retail, I know how retail works. Okay. I don't sell retail. So I don't sell, usually a guy who makes a bait and sells it to a store, sold yeah. it, we call Keystone. So he sold it at the price he wants to get, the store takes yeah. it, they double that. So they're making as much, if not more than he did. It's the yeah. same thing. I just yeah. don't sell retail. So if they want to buy a lure for 200 and then flip it, it's called flipping for yeah. 400. Okay. I mean, it makes me look more reasonable. Right. <laughs> and so, if, yeah, yeah, it does. yeah. Also the $200 and all that bad. You know, it, it, you know, it, it, when you, when you say it like that, it actually, it's true. You know, you're still, you're still make, I mean, you, you've got to make profit. Profit's not a dirty word. We've all got to make profit. That's big. That's business. Yep. Um, but I suppose when you individually do things like you do, you know, I sell fuel tankers and I've no, I, I don't make anything fuel tankers. I'm a salesman. I know what people want to buy. They tell me what to build. I get it built for them. I don't, I don't manufacture. I don't paint it. All I do is do them an invoice at the end and charge them that money. You know, and what I charge is depending on, on how much work goes into making that vehicle. And when I see how much work goes into it, when I see the profits in it, sometimes I look at it and think, that's not enough profit. You know, it's, there's a lot of it's a long, long time, you know, and I look at profits and I think it's not enough. But then when you speak to the customer, they're like, but it's too much, you know, and there's a you find it's to sell stuff in life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way it is. So that doesn't bug me at all. Sometimes it bugs me a little bit. Because, uh, Especially so, when you see them for sale at $1,000 and you sell it for 200 That's that, oh, yeah, uh, that, that, that me now even talking about it. Yeah, the funny thing is there's been baits that I've sold at a show and yeah. my guys who work the booth with me be like, look, he just bought that one. It's already up for sale and sold on eBay. Like no uh, way. literally minutes after they buy it, they're standing in the aisle taking pictures of it. It's really funny. Like, I, I, again, I think you know, there's, there's a niche in the market, Joe, for a, a, a Yorkshireman it's buying all your lures and selling for a profit. And there's a couple of English guys as well. I think I might do it the same way. There's, I can, well, there's yeah. money to be made somewhere in selling lures secondhand. Oh, yeah, get your 15 kids in line at the show. <laughs> I've got one of every color, a kid of every color as well, even two in perch pattern. So I'm doing quite well. Uh, right, next one's a bloke that you actually know, you, you speak to on a regular basis, and it's Barry Robinson, who was making himself one hell of a name in the UK at this moment in time. He's just made a lure for one of my pals, right? A lad that fish we drew. He's just made him a Cabris Cream Egg wrapper lure. What? <laughs> do, you, do you get Cabris Cream Eggs in America? Yeah, yeah. Have you, have you seen the one? Yeah. And he's done eggs as eyes, which yeah, is just, yeah. it's honestly, it's bizarre. He's made me a couple of really nice ones. And he's just made some stunning mirror carp ones. And, uh, you know, he's growing. He's growing in UK to be, I would say at the moment, I would say he's probably the pinnacle in UK alone makers yeah. of, of custom where I can ring him up and say, Barry, make me that. I, I'll, um, if I've got two minutes, I'll nip out to garage. And I'll show you a, a roach pattern. And I said to him, make me a roach lure and make it look like it's bleeding in its gills. Yeah. Right. You know, as if it's injured and it's bleeding from gills. The blood on that lure, you look at that and you think that is real blood. It's, it is getting that good and it's multi-layering and stuff how it paints it. Listen, I don't, I can't talk to both of you about lure fishing because, you know, how to make lures. You are both literally fantastic at what you do. Um, but he's got a couple of questions for you. Oh, good. Okay. Uh oh. Right, it says uh, this, and, and do you know what? When he asked me this, I thought that is just an ace question. Uh, you might hate me on the for this, but it's really good. Um, is there a lure out there that you've seen that you didn't design that you wish you had it done? Oh, he wants me to say the gliding trout. No, sure. I don't. No, no, I can't say that. No, no, no. I got to no, fantastic lures, though. But I, I will say that they are fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Let me. Th um, there is. Let me think of. Um, there's been. You know, the funny thing is the things that are simple. I yeah. don't do simple. And I, you know, the whole saying, keep it simple, stupid. I tend yeah. to overcomplicate things. I think of these designs. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. And I can make one. <laughs> but to replicate and then, them. I never replicate it again. Yeah. 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 And so the, I, I can't think of a specific one in general right now. If you give me some time, I'll, I'll, I'll give you names. But yeah. um, the lures that are simple are not the way my brain works all the time. Okay. And I look at them and go, well, duh. I mean, that's brilliant. 
you know, yeah. I, I made a version of that and it was so effing complicated. Yeah, it was beautiful or whatever. You know, I don't think my idea, yeah. but the craftsmanship's cool and I tweaked it yeah. and did this, it was really interesting, um, yeah. but I could make one. And this guy figured out a way to make a bait do the same thing and it was the simplest solution and poof, they did it. Yeah. And I, I really respect that. I think that's cool. Yeah. That's part of the art, for, art too, even though that person might not get credit for it, yeah. um, it being art or craftsmanship, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, I'll probably come back to that with a name of something, but that's the stuff that usually that usually you know, I look at. I, I look at Lowe's that's out nowadays, you know, and and the good thing is for us, and especially for yourself, is that custom like jerk baits coming back in. They had a little spell in like early two thousands where they went a little bit. Everybody bringing out these crazy soft plastics, you know, it looked like yeah. fish and look like bloody Perfect. eels and they look like all sorts of weird stuff like um, gobies and stuff like that, and 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 people got sidetracked away from what like like myself and yourself jerkbait fishermen and glidebait fishermen and yep. it's nice to see them making a comeback in the uk and people starting to buy them there's actually a really good trade at the moment like i say you've got some really good lure makers like like barry uh, but then you look at stuff it's come out it's just like you think that is so simple mirius mouse is oh, just yeah, brilliant how, how stupidly simple yeah. is that lure what what he's made yeah. And how effective it's been. How many yeah. people must have looked at that and thought, that'll never work. I remember I, I remember hearing about them lows about three or four years ago. I remember the lads, I went over to Ireland fishing, and one of the lads said, all they use on them boats on Derg is mouse. It's a little world called the Marius Mouse. I went, never heard of it. Never heard of it. He goes, I'm telling you now, they're catching so many fish on them lures. And it's an yeah. Italian guy who made them. And then, obviously, now it works at CWC, and uh, that it's one of our products. And you like to think to yourself, it's such a simple, simple thing yeah. that is done, and it's so yeah. it's catching so many fish. Has it caught many? Has it caught many muskies in in states? No, not really. And the funny thing about the well, not yet. The thing yeah, is, yeah. you know, he, some I have some fifteen inch custom ones. Two, the only two in the world he made for musky fishing. Yeah, um, and I just got them. We got them. I got them last year, and so right. we've raised some really big monsters. It's only a okay. matter of time before we we get one to eat. So it's going to yeah. catch a really big fish. Like yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Yeah, and the funny thing about that bait is that's a perfect example. I made a really crazy one. It was, it was, yeah. it was more like a beaver bait, I guess you say. Beaver okay. is a type of one in the States. Kind of yeah. beautiful fish head, long body, really, really cool. But I suck at tying the hair and stuff. Yeah, so it looks awesome. really cool. After I did yeah. that one, I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I caught fish on it. Yeah. I'll never make another one. <laughs> you know? no, no, and then no. the, the mouse came out. I'm like, oh, well, now I certainly don't have to make Listen, just, just getting back in mind what you, what, what lure, one lure you wish you were in charge of, and which one you think, bloody hell, I missed out on that one. I had that idea. But, uh, yeah. right, what else have I got here? Um, I like called Mark Benton. Benton Lures, Mark Benton Lures, another really, you know, really, really good lure, uh, lure maker. And he's made a lot of lures. I've got quite a few of his lures. He does like jack tails and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, cool. it's, it's, it's got a bit of all sorts. Again, fantastic finishes, really, really good finishes. And this is one for your own products, actually. It said, how does True Coat work? Uh, oh. And how did you come up with the idea for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's simple. It's complicated, but simple, I guess. Yeah. Um, so the main driver um, of True Coat, which I stated in the opening, was a lot of my friends are getting really sick. And um, okay. we're all using ETEX or EX74, which is this epoxy yeah. that a lot of builders use. It was never made to be used at, at, at the um, the quantity that we're using it. It was a one yeah. and done. So when they make it, it's like you make a tabletop, you go. Yeah. You know, you might yeah. once in your life have exposure to these chemicals in it. And, you know, here we are, most lure makers in a small enclosed space, breathing these vapors yeah. every day. Yeah. And um, uh, the, the real driver to this is actually um, a very famous lure maker named, named Rolf. He, he had a bait called um, the Wishmaster. He's a Canadian guy. Beautiful baits. Yeah. They're the most expensive baits at the time. My yeah. baits were 40 bucks. His were 350. I mean, this is way back. Okay. And I remember um, talking to Rolf and talking to another friend, Todd Cleveland, who um, uh, made the Phantom Glide yeah. bait. Fantastic, yeah. And uh, we were at a trade show and all of us were pointing. At the time, I was, I think maybe, I don't know, I think I was 38 years old yet. And I was having these weird heart palpitations. And okay. all of them were too. Um, both of them subsequently have passed away. Um, oh. Anyway, uh, that's a longer story of what um, their doctors think they passed away from. Um, but we were all talking about that, and we all were convinced from the epoxy, the epoxy fumes. I talked to my doctor, and my doctor said, absolutely. It's like you're yeah. pumping glue every night. Yeah. And so that was the main driver. Um, I have a friend who's a chemist, um, 
and we talked about over the years and just never did it because it was kind of a little bit of expenditure to get it going. Um, but when I first talk, when I started talking to chemists, I said, I want to take out the solvents and the preservatives because resin on its own isn't poisonous at all. It's a natural product. Yep. But the other the uh, products that are out there are made to sit on a shelf for years because yeah, they so sit in your I, big store. To make it up. Yeah. And that's what's poisonous. So it's the solvents and it's the preservatives. We yeah. took that out. So that was the main driver. But then when we started talking about things, um, I said, he said, well, what else do you want in it? I said, well, I want a faster cure time. Like, you know, can we get it to cure? Uh, if it's heat cure, can we get things to cure up four or five hours? Yeah, you can reapply on three, which is yeah. like, I mean, usually ETEX is 12 hours, you know, so yeah. that was a big coup. And I said, you know, can we can we make it bubble free? Yeah. But that was like the biggest shocker to me. I'm, I'm, like, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm like, we can? He said, yeah, we can make it more bubble free. I mean, you're always going to have I mean, that's just the definition for any, anybody make, doing epoxy is air bubbles. But it just it's got it. Finish, got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I understood you on that one. What, say it again. The, the... Yeah, so an air bubble can just, just destroy a finish of a lower. Just yes. one single air bubble in, in epoxy, yeah. in clear epoxy is just shocking. Cobs, I used to have a few cobs with a few air bubbles and it used to rile me. But yeah, obviously, no. they were all the lower stuff, yeah. Right. That was the biggest coup for me. I thought you said edibles at first. I don't know no, 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 I'm not like that. Edibles? We can make it's, edibles in the past. It must be my Yorkshire, Yorkshire, my Yorkshire, Minnesota, like, language barrier. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, so what we did to get the bubbles out is all the epoxies in the world, everyone except for mine, uh, is made to cure from the top down. So you mix the epoxy up. The second you mix the two parts together, yeah. it starts forming a micro sealing. And that okay. means you don't see it, you can't tell, but it starts to cure immediately. And so right. it's curing from the top down. The problem with that okay. is the bubbles are stuck. They can't get out of the top. And that's yeah. why guys have to do blow torches and do all this weird stuff to try to get the bubbles that are trapped out. Okay. And eventually it, it's done, you can't. Mine cures from the bottom up. We just changed the cure ratio. And so now, which, and this is also the way resin wants to cure naturally. Yeah. Um, the big box resins reversed it. So we actually are doing it naturally. They're the yep. ones who actually changed it because they wanted it to cure. Um, they wanted it to feel cured for anyone who was putting it on a bar top so yep. that if they used it the next day, they wouldn't ruin the finish, right? Okay. Even though it's curing underneath. Anyway, yep. so ours naturally cures from the bottom up. And so all those bubbles are up here. The epoxy comes and pushes yeah. the bubbles out. And so I still do some torching in the winter when it's colder or whatnot. Most guys yep. don't do anything. They just brush it on, they're good. Yeah, and so, I've, seen, um, I've seen a couple of the finishes from, from um, Druco. Unbelievable. The real, it is really, really good. And it's an horrible yeah, job. That's, it's that's a horrible job. The nice thing about it, too, is it's all, I do small batches of it, just like I do baits. Yeah. And so yeah. instead of mixing 10,000 gallons at a time and sending out to the store, yeah. we're doing 100 gallons at a time. So you're always going to get something that's only a few months old. What uh, Mark's asked for, he says... If, is there any plans to make the uh, true coat in smaller quantities so you could let maybe dip small small lures in there? Well, you know, I've actually done that before. Um, so I used to sell it in a couple of different smaller sizes that just didn't sell. Okay. And so I stopped doing it. Um, but never say never. I mean, I, I might bring yeah. it back. Uh, and now I have more and more guys who are making custom fishing rods using it. And yeah. they've all requested smaller quantities. So, um, yeah, I'm taking a look at it for sure. Okay. Um, the only bummer thing for that is shipping over to like someone like Barry. The shipping is like insane, oh, even for sure. small ones. So it's like yeah. might buy a big quantity first, I guess. But have you got any like, distributors in the UK? Uh, no, I don't. I don't really do distributors per se um, okay. because my margins are so slim, which I know you'll understand from, from yeah, cool. um, selling. So my margins are just too slim right now to really have distributor. Okay. As I get bigger though, and we start selling yeah. more and more. Um, that's yeah. something I look at in the future. I do you, have you um, made it your full time job, aren't you? Now you've 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 stopped working in sales. Yeah. You're literally concentrating fully on what you do now. Yeah, yeah, and so that's that's exactly right. So um, the plan is to, of course, grow all the brands now that I'm doing it full time. Okay. Um, so, like I said, right now we don't have a distributor, but that's in the works for sure too. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. So that's basically four lure builds in UK asking you questions. And I said when when I when I said I would have speak to you, and I said that these these guys were like, "Oh my God, give me two minutes, I'll be back." Straight back. <laughs> and literally at the ping, at night time, they were pinging through to me and all these questions. So that's some guy sorted out. So we've done. I reckon there's nearly, there's nearly an hour there. That's just talking about this. So I'm gonna just I'm gonna fire through some of these questions. Right? Sure. There's no point in making it too long because we've covered so much really yeah. quality stuff. Joe. It's you know you I couldn't have asked some of these questions. So. <laughs> right. 
Favourite species, I'm guessing it's that big thing behind you. No, I'm sorry, the one? Your favourite species. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, it's muskies. I love muskies. You know, I do bass fish now too, and I okay. smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, but not, I mean, that's something to do when the muskie season isn't open. Absolutely. So. It's just open for you. It's the last week it opened for you, so you yeah. just started. Yeah. Yeah. And you've caught a few, but nothing too big yet. Yeah, nothing big yet. So I've got a couple of small, I think they're smaller fish. There are okay. a couple of my friends. I'll be, oh yeah, I got a small one. It was forty-two inches, and I need to take a picture. And they're like, "What?" You know. So yeah. I, I'm kind of a. I, I know that uh, at least in like in Sweden they call it a, um, a specimen hunter. So I like yeah, the big yeah. ones. Yeah. I mean, uh, just the big ones. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not. You know, there's been times where I've actually shaken smaller fish off, or okay. they come in the figure eight. I'm like, I don't want to hurt them. Like, just let them go. It's not what I'm after. Yeah. And so um, I want the big ones. <laughs> So. I, I believe I'm very safe. I'm a specimen hunter. I just never catch any. We only open try. Um, right, so that's that one. Um, what's your favorite method for targeting musky? For tagging a musky? For targeting. So literally. Oh, for targeting oh. musky. Yeah, I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I like all of it, actually. And like, I, I'm, I would say probably if I had a specialty, um, yeah. I'm, I like fishing deep. And so you can see that in the guppy, probably yeah, the golf. lake I fish is there's weeds down to almost, you know, 30 feet in some spots now. Yeah. And so I really do like fishing deep. Um, that said, I also love it in the fall when they're up on the sand and they're two feet of water and you're working a top water over them. I, yeah. I like it all. I mean, that's, I think if you look at my breadth of assortment of lures that I make, you can almost follow. There's a couple of things you can see. If you can yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you can see actually the real funny thing is you can actually see like my home lake is a lake called Lake Minnetonka. It used yeah. to be um, before they had zebra mussels, which are an invasive species, which have cleared up the water. You yeah. can see my lure choices start to change as the yeah, lake has totally yeah. changed. You know? Yeah, because obviously the clearer they get, the more the more natural colors and stuff. It's yeah, and that's yeah. how it all evolves. Uh, one thing we were talking about there but about the guppy for fishing deep, there's not many lures um, out there, not many jerk baits that want to stay deep. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been one of the things that's always infuriated me. I've, I've I've fished a lot of lures, and as soon as you start working, it's same work, you know, just because of that, you know, especially if you're on a boat and you're yeah. fishing, you know, I have to I'm trying to explain. I'll say this is your this is your lure. You try to fish a lure there, but you're also try to reel it in up towards up towards yourself, and to keep it deep, it, it's it's all to do with timing and working your lure. You know, at distance you're working it faster, and when it's closer to you, you're working it slower, and it's it's that part's been really hard. And I remember the first time I saw a guppy using I, I, this lad was using it over 17 foot of water, and he was fishing it really deep. And I'm like, "Is that a specially weighted version?" And he goes, "No, that's a standard. That's what all guppies are like. That apart from yeah. if you downsize, the downsize works a little bit higher." Yeah, yeah, downsize, the downsize yeah. works a little bit higher. But we also yeah. make the shallow version, which is yeah, yeah, cost up too, of course. But yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, again, I mean, that's indicative of the waters I fish here in Minnesota. Yeah. Most glide baits, we want to fish deep, and guys can't get them to. But yeah. if you look at uh, like if you look at the shape of a guppy, um, you'll notice if you look at it like straight on at the nose. Um, yeah. You probably want to. I've got a little one here, but if you look straight on, let's see if I can get this here. Yes, yeah. it's um, the body isn't flat. If that makes sense, it's convex. So okay. like this this part of the body here has yeah. a little bit of a curve to it on both sides. Yeah. And um, most glide baits are flat. They're flat sided, which is great because and I make some that way too. But it gives a lot of flash and etc. The yeah. problem with that is it it's more water resistant, and yeah, yeah, when water resistant, yeah, yeah. it comes up. Lift. Yeah, yeah. And so the guppy um, has that convex sides yeah. for for keeping it down. That's one yeah. of the main reasons I designed it that way, and also for um, for hook points. And so again, this guy's so small, you probably can't. See, there's my camera. You probably can't see it, but um, yeah. with the body being convex, it's thinner at the bottom here, yeah. and so your hook points are always exposed. You know, ask and, it, uh, you know, thickness of bait yeah mm -hmm. which yeah. is hard to do on, on a heavier bait it's mm -hmm. hard to get density without bulk and it's right. hard to get up there so yeah I, I understand that yeah yeah exactly so i'm writing all this down i'm gonna to have to make me own custom jay baits after this you, you, you <laughs> well, yeah i do <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you uh, some um <clears throat> what's your preferred conditions if you if you were to wake up tomorrow morning and the conditions were perfect what conditions would there be for musky so the funny thing is, I can tell you exactly because now that I'm doing this for a living, I can fish anytime I want, which is great. But for the most part, 
And so that's, I'm always that's, that's the next question. How many days a week do you fish? And that's going to be sick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I look at the I look at the weather and I'm looking for days where it's going to be prefrontal right before yeah. a big storm comes in. I yeah. love fishing like in the nasty I, when it really pours and rains, I'm not going to catch anything. So not that, but right before prefrontal, I'm always out now trying to get fish. <clears throat> I also like the first cold front days. Okay. You know, muskies love cold fronts. Uh, pike okay. are not quite the same. Muskies yeah, yeah. are the biggest fish. They take advantage of everything else being disoriented. Yep. So that first like really cold front or even late fall when it's so brutal out that you're freezing your line eyes. Uh, right. or, uh, guys are freezing. I love yeah. that. The shittier, yeah. the, okay, I swear in here, but the shittier yeah. the weather, the more I like it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I like feeling like I accomplished something, you know, so. It, it, it's weird, you know, I was out fishing yesterday and it started, ra- it was b- really hard rain for about four hours. And it's yeah. the first time the since season started on rivers, so we could rivers. And I was there and I was, I was looking at all these people, you know, on boats, bobbing around and all these people walking down banking in the town. And you can't beat the winter when it's horrible, it's cold and nobody's out. Love it. She's empty, there's nobody there, and that's what when you you what I call hard yeah. first thing in the morning where it's really hard frost, you know, and you're driving up water and it's minus four or five degrees, which in Minnesota, I'm not sure how cold it gets in winter there. I'm, I'm sure it's bloody cold. very <laughs> it's much cold is in the UK, but like you know, if it's minus ten and you get on water and it's and mist comes off water, that's that's pike fishing for me. Yeah. Your tag in muskies in what we would class a summer. So in UK, we don't try and some people do go out and target to catch pike. And listen, if you're fishing the right waters with enough enough oxygen, right. you can pick the lakes, especially in Scotland and Ireland. You know, never get warm. They're they're freezing cold all year. Um, but I personally don't aim for them. I, I, I caught a few yesterday on light on small lures because I generally fish for perch. You know, it's it's quite a big species, yeah. isn't it? You, where people target, you know, especially on lures. So I was using like little small, little, you know, like little tiny small lures, kept catching lots and lots of fish. You do catch them, catch a big one, um, which is unusual because your season, your musky season, is now and when does it end? Yeah, so it ends December first. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, when the water temps get really hot, you know, yeah. I'm we're pretty far north, so. Um, our season just started, but it's still quite cold. It's a, it's very very much like Sweden, I guess I'd say. So we never okay. we do get really hot spells for sure, uh, and we have a week or two where the water temps are too warm to really go after fish, okay. um, and that's where I go bass fishing or I just do something else, you know. Um, but usually it's open. Uh, one thing I should bring up too that are a little bit more um, idiosyncratic to muskies is night fishing. Yeah. I forgot to say I love night fishing because of the same reasons you're saying. There's yeah, yeah. nobody out there. Nobody there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I live in a pretty big city. There's, you know, 4 million people around me and uh, my home lake, Lake Minnetonka, can get, yeah. it's a famous fishery for bass and muskies yeah. and everything, um, but it can get really hammered, uh, especially with pleasure boaters and stuff. And going yeah. back out there at night is like being back up in the woods again. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, the yeah. lake can yeah. be itself. It's it's a yeah. whole different experience. I love and night you, fishing. You're getting, good results. you're getting good results on musky at nighttime. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The big fish. Well, you're, night. Yeah, you're using headlights, so you're literally just doing off field because it must be the most scariest thing on earth pulling one of those in and something. Oh, well, yeah, you get used to it. And we still yeah, have yeah. our scares once in a while, but no no headlamps really. I mean, your eyes adjust so well. Yeah, yeah. Enough, enough say, I mean, you must be it's a big lake as well. How many, how many acres is that? Uh, 14,000 acres. So oh, it's, it's a, a pretty lake. big lake. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's really big. Yeah. It's pretty big. It's it's one of the. Like so, in Yorkshire, yeah. 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 Um, and we fish like uh, the big lake I fish is 44,000 acres. That's like Lax. Wow. We fish yeah, that yeah. there too. Yeah. Um, but no, the headlamp muskies actually like almost kind of glow, especially if there's moonlight. You can see them coming yeah. in, following your bait just like a normal day. Yeah. It's really cool. So, I'll bet yeah, that. that's cool. Not good for the art lab, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Not yeah. good for the art lab. Forget yeah. about epoxy fumes. I'd be more worried about getting a 50 inch. <laughs> yeah. Like, one one eats to the boat and you're not expecting it and it's midnight and you're tired. Oh, come on. Yeah. What about trophy shots at night time? Do you manage to get some decent trophy shots that, that still look Perfect. okay? Uh, oh, you mean, oh, pictures, you mean? Yeah, some decent pictures if, you, if it is yeah. night time. They're not always that great, to tell you the truth. But yeah. again, that's not the reason I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I was my, I want to see them myself, you know? I but remember the, seeing them. Um, they, they were a really, really big musky cotton. I don't know if it's a world record musky, and it were a guy 
and he went fishing in Detroit or something like that. It was a really random place. Yeah. Or it makes, or it makes, not Michigan. Well, Lake St. Clair is, is Detroit, so yeah, that makes sense. There's big fish there, skinny, but they're big. If I'm not mistaken, but it were, I remember seeing this huge fish, and that was at night time. And he mm -hmm. said, oh, I, just, I went for a walk down and started fishing. And, caught this huge, and I remember seeing this fish, and it was absolutely colossal. Yeah, I mean, anybody, you know, obviously we're, 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 um, we're talking about pike lures and musky lures. Anybody that's not seen any of the big, you know, um, musky videos on YouTube on, in, in States, you've got to go on YouTube and type in musky yeah. fishing. There's some, you know, like, um, oh, my God, there's so many different channels. I, I, I watch so many, wow. and, and they're all really worth watching. You know, just yeah. type in musky, big muskies, and there's literally hundreds of videos. And you type in 15-inch musky. That'll yeah. be a idea. I mean, there's one video always always rem reminds me of it, and it's a guy fishing... I can't remember fishing a top water, and if and this musket comes in and turns at the last second and it misses it low by a millimeter, and it's yeah. a big guy. It were a bash. It were like a, a musket show. It must be like a show over there. There were on these three guys on this boat, and this okay. bloke just turns around, and you can see by the sickening look on his face <laughs> how fish was. And when you see it in slow motion turning sideways, I mean, its its head is as wide, you know, wide open could swallow a human head. You know, it were that yeah. big. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. You, so, so, so fish that um, there's a fish two years ago that we were in two feet of water and I was fishing a walk the dog top water bait and the, it was a tournament. I mean, actually, it was a tournament this we won that one, but we would have. Um, we, I didn't even care about the damn tournament. This fish was 58 inches or bigger, wow. and it came and it has head. Its head was the mouth was open. It was just had the bait. Of, you know, it was a 12 inch bait in the middle of its mouth, but the fish was so big and moving so fast, it made like a tidal wave in front of its mouth. So my bait back. was surfing. Yeah, so no. I just, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I just kept really as yeah. fast as I could to try to keep up. And he never got in his mouth because every time he closed his mouth, the water spit out. I mean, is and that so, the biggest fish you've ever seen? No, no, I've seen I've seen a couple <laughs> of blacks that are really big. That, that was, a, that was a, a memorable one for sure. Um, so but there's been some that, fall fish. Is that six? Is a sixty being caught a sixty-inch musket? Yeah, they, there's been fifty nines for sure that I've seen caught. Oh. Um, I've heard of sixties. I've never seen them in my own eyes. I've seen pictures yeah. and they look sixty for sure. I've yeah. seen fish that I think were sixty or maybe even bigger on um, Lake Mille Lacs where I where I fish in the fall, and they're yeah. fat. I mean, they're you know they're that, that fish is big, but it, it's pretty fat. That's a good fish, but they're they look like seals. They're that fat, and um. Yeah, that's why I keep doing it. Is it the YouTube channel calls it Today's Angler? Yeah, yeah, great with Lee. Mm -hmm. he's, he's stuff. My mate Drew said to me, you've got to watch this guy. He's fantastic. He's just, yeah. he's just I love watching their videos. And like yeah. I said, there's quite a few YouTube videos out there. But if yeah. you do, you know, you've got to watch some of them videos. It'll just, Pike just seems so insignificant when you look <laughs> at a musket. Well, you guys have, if we had Pike like you guys have the size, I, yeah, I like yeah. fish pike here too, but our pike are small. There's a newer pike. I mean, what's a big pike in in states? Well, I mean, I I have caught a fifteen. I have caught fifteen inch pike here. So, um, but that was so rare, and so it was on musky baits at night. That's potentially. I can't remember. Long. I think fifty two with British record. Oh, yeah, but they're so much fatter. Our, our, yeah. This one I caught was fat, but it wasn't like. It wasn't like okay. European pattern. Not like I want a big fat pig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you guys yeah. drip your fish drip fat. I mean, they're just they're know, different species. Fat. They just are. Yeah. And usually the pike here are thirty inches, forty inches. People are yeah. are talking about them, you know, but they're not. It's not the same thing. It's just but not. we do have like a scale, and it's uh, we was around. I think about forty inches generally around um, a twenty pound pike. So if it's yeah. forty yeah. inches, it's generally a, it's generally a twenty pound pike. I've right. I've got. But I've caught some 22 and 23 pound pike that have been a lot longer. And then I've caught some that have also been shorter that have been 20. But, you know, it depends what time of year you're catching them. If you catch yeah. them with a board and stuff, or, or they've been on an hard feed, you know, if they've been bad water and then they've fed hard. So it, it does change all the time. Yeah, here too. Uh, let's have a look what we've got. We know, we know how much of fish, which is ridiculous. Um, who's been the biggest influence in your career, your fishing career? In my fishing career or bait building yeah. career? Well, pro probably fishing, to be honest with you. That, you know, yeah. um, I suppose you've learned yourself out of met lures. But yeah. Who's, yeah. You know, who were the first person that said, listen, Joe, you, don't, you need to stop playing American football and play baseball. You need to be a fisherman. Who, yeah. who were that um, person, you think? Well, it's going to be my dad for sure. I mean, my dad is my biggest influence in fishing in general. Um, yeah. but, but apart from my dad, um, 
I don't know. I've always kind of, I've always kind of done things on my own and like to figure things out on my own. I would say the one person I do look up to quite a few people. Of course, there's a lot of people that are fantastic fishermen. Yeah. Um, the person I fish with the most that I can really say um, has kind of influenced things I've done, especially as it pertains to keeping up with modern technology and like you know our 360 sonar and stuff like that and side imaging. You're not going to say Truman, are you? I'm sorry. You're not going to say Truman. No, well, Truman is Truman's great. Everybody though. says Truman. Yeah. It really. Okay. Oh, no, Let's go down that path. Truman and Pierre, Andre. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've I've had the pleasure or mispleasure of fishing with those guys multiple times. Yeah. I love them. They're freaking awesome and they're amazing fishermen. But fishing behind them in the back of the boat is like yeah. having a seam net in the front of the boat catching every <laughs> effing pike. And I yeah. sit back there like, oh, yeah. you know, using lures that I hardly ever use, and it's just yeah, every good. fish is Pierre. Go on, go, go on. You know? so, yeah. Those, those guys are amazing. And, and for pike fishing, I mean, I don't know. I know a lot of pike fishermen, but I don't know many people better than those two. I'm sure there are. Um, no, but yeah. those two. They're out of there. Yeah. Oh, they're up there. And as a team, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. Results speak for themselves. Those two are amazing. So, yeah. For pike fishing, it would be those guys for sure. Yeah. Go on then. Sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. Go on. Tell me. Who no, that's good. I'm having a hard time remembering things. I would say the person here in the States that, um, I, I, I fish with that I always glean some sort of knowledge from um, is my friend Matt Seifert. He's a famous guide here. Um, okay. And Matt, more so um, more so in terms of, of the way he, his boat control and his use of technology. He's yeah. just, he's just smart. I mean, you know, and I, I'm, you know, he's light years ahead of me as far as using all the side imaging and deciphering yeah. things. But I'm yeah. a much better fisherman because I fish with him. And he's, uh, you know, I've watched what he does and he's shared information with me that way. And yeah. so I would say for sure, he has definitely um, most recently been a guy who's influenced the way I fish, for sure. Brilliant Te guy. Technology has changed how we all fish. I mean, funnily enough, I've just got rid of my fish finder. I've been a Lawrence oh, yeah. since started fishing. I started with Garmin, old Garmin's. Uh, then I've gone up to um, Lawrence and now I'm changing. I'm going up to Hummingbird now with Mega Imaging. Yeah. And, you know... I, I, my fishing's changed completely just by the technology. You know, it's, I'm, I'm mainly a river fisherman, so that's what I generally target. You know, I'm, I'm local. I've got rivers all around me. I've no really big still waters. That, you know, you're talking, which in a big run to you, like a th two and a half, three hour trip on a Saturday morning to go fishing for eight hours and come back. It's, it's a long, long day and it takes it out of you. So I'm, I'm lucky I've got rivers within like half an hour, 40 yeah. minutes from now, so I can fish plenty of water. But the problem with rivers, they change constantly, not like still waters. Right. So a river where it had a tree in the middle of the water, you know, you couldn't see one week. Right. You go back three weeks later and it's another 500 yards down the road. So right. having really good side imaging and downstanding is a big, big thing to me. Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to using auto chart, you know, and, and make a proper good map. You could have done it with Lawrence, but it's it's, it's complicated to do it. And I'm, I'm looking at that live chart to me is going to be is going to change my fishing massively. In oh, my own head, I, I seem to know my waters. You know, I know the lines to go on these rivers where I know I'm going to catch fish. I do a lot of trawling, yeah. um, so I, I know the lines to run and what lures to have on at that moment in time. When I pass that dead tree, I need to have this lure on because it's right. going to drop off. And you know, I know that, but the the side imaging on the on the hummingbird helix and solid is like nothing it's else. Oh, I just installed the Mega 360 imaging on mine last week. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, it's I mean, and uh, uh, thing about muskies this time of season, a lot of time I'm fishing out over 100 feet of water. After okay. they spawn, they go and they suspend, and yeah. um, that has been, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, you can see the fish. I mean, it's it's, a, it's amazing. Yeah, but then you, can, you do see them. I mean, I've seen oh. I've seen some screenshots of muskie, and you are literally seeing yes. a muskie. 40 yards to your right hand side, yes. facing away from you. That the technology is that good. As if it's yes. like that picture back, as if it's like that musky behind you, it's shadow. That is literally mm -hmm. what you see on that screen. Is that is oh. that good? Yeah, it's that good. And I, I've, on some lakes I fish further north of here that are all rocks and don't have a lot of weeds. I, yeah. I still swear I saw a musky on the outside imaging and you can almost see its markings. I mean I'm like, yeah, oh it's a musky, it's not a no. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's amazing, I know that, amazing technology. Well, the the new Garmin, that new Garmin Pan is it Panaplex or something like that. I've seen yeah. I've seen the Musky video, and there's a father and son. They're quite famous YouTubers. I don't know if you know them. And they're both fishing off one side of bait of a boat, and one's using a jig, if I'm not mistaken, a big curly tub tail jig, and then yeah. other ones using. I, I forgot what they, I, I, we don't have it in UK. It's probably it's probably illegal, and it's like a, an umbrella with baits hanging off it. Oh yeah, yeah, right, yeah. You know, and it, and it comes That's up and down like that. 
and and it's illegal the, here too, but yeah. Oh, there you go then. Well, I, it, I'm not going to grass them up. Um, but <laughs> the, it shows him using them, and it shows him catching muskies on that. And to see the take on the on the screen before they get the the you know the slack line takes. Yeah. It, it's just it, it's. Yeah. It's crazy. Actually, that is- it's a Canadian, it's a Canadian uh, YouTube channel, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 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 so yeah. they're legal there. So you, yeah. But uh, no, the, it, I remember watching that one too. That was, it's so cool. Yeah, I play with the panoptics a little bit. It's cool. It's yeah. cool stuff for sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. Three sixty. Hopefully, I'll have three sixty one day. You just never oh, know. Yeah, that's good. It might, I'm not sure I work on a river. I, I, on still waters, I can imagine it being really good. I'm not sure I'd work on a river with, with obviously contours. I, I don't. Know. It'd be interesting to see. I've used it on the river. I fish rivers a lot too. And okay. so I've used it on our St. Croix River. It's, it's yeah. I mean, our river is the river I'm fishing has lots of riverine sections that are fast flowing current and yeah. large open lakes too. But yeah. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll be able to use no problem. And there'll no be stuff you don't see. No problem. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I'm not disappointed with what I get with my Lawrence. My Lawrence has been fantastic. You know, yeah, side yeah. uh, just been fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it's just time, you know, when you get to a time and you like to think yourself, I need a different, you know, I just need a, another notch. You need to go up another level. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what I need. My my rivers that I fish need that little extra little bit of yeah. thought. And I think it will it will definitely catch me more fish. I'm, yeah, I'm, my game imaging is insane. But anyway, it's not like an ad for hummingbird, but I mean, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, if you won the lottery <laughs> tomorrow, yeah. and you have unlimited funds, would you still yeah. do what you do today? Of course you do, because you've got the yeah. dream job. Yeah, yeah, I would. You've I mean, like, the dream that's, job. Yeah, I, I would for sure because I mean the the way that I have I have things set up now is um, it doesn't it doesn't feel like work. I love it. I mean it's my creative outlet. I I will always do this. So um, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't change anything. Frankly, I do the same. On an apprentice like me to come across and and I'll I'll, I'll whittle the lures away while you go and catch muskie. Then I'll yeah, you want to whittle lures? That'd be great. You can give me a lead work guy. <laughs> like yeah, a, like actually, a people have asked me quite a bit, and I just um, I can imagine. I would never take the fun away from me, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. sounds selfish, but I love all of it. So you, uh, you certainly, get worlds, you know, you get in your fishing time, and you're also making lures that are to go fishing with it. I don't think you get much better. I don't no. think you, I've said it to other people, uh, especially like people like Pierre, um, you know, who fish all day, every day, and yeah. then they go home and they think about fishing. Yeah. It, it's hard on the body. I mean, Pierre's struggling yeah. with his back. I know that he's really, really struggling yeah. with his back, and and I know how hard it is when when you you know I had a really bad back. So I know how hard it is pumping loads all day. If you're doing it for a living, it, it must take its toll on your body. And eventually your body's going to say, no, it's going to say, yeah. you, you have to stop doing this or you change what you're actually doing. So I understand it's it's a big, big thing. So you've got to get the balance, I suppose, between um, personal life. It, are you married, Joe? I am, yeah. Married yeah. two kids. Yeah. You've, got, you've got personal life, you know, you've got children. So you've got to, it, it's about give and take and, uh, you yep. know, having enough time with girls and your wife and enough time to have fishing. Plus you've got a business to run. So it's all about balance, I suppose. A hundred percent. Yeah. Because, you know, I think, of course, we all dream about fishing all the time, right? But as exactly yeah. you say, sometimes you go and you fish so much, it's just the joy is taken out of it. You know, I, it, to me, it's still an escape. I want to go when I want to go. And yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. And I also, of course, love my wife and my kids. Absolutely. I want to spend time with them. So it is a hundred percent. So, yeah. yeah. I think, um, th- I think the bonus of having a, a, an opportunity like you've got where you can go, when, you can probably plan to go fishing when it's right. I think that's a big, big thing for any fisherman, isn't it? Yeah. People who can fish the most will catch more fish. Right. Yeah. Time on the water for sure. And so, so, in other words, if I if I could fish three days a week, and I could pick those three days a week, I know that those days a week will be on, on the, the rivers will be bang on. You know, right. I will pick the, to the hour and say at that time that river's going to fish. I need to be on it then. And two or three hours later, or yeah. four hours later, it won't fish. I can come off. Right. I think that's a dream for most fishermen. And I know a lot of guys who fish, who, who, who have jobs specifically so they can go fishing. Yeah, right, yeah. You know, and, and I take my hat off to them, you know, that's an amazing thing to do. But at the end of the life, when it's you've got a grave, and it, it won't say top fisherman, you know, right. they won't like, no dad, and I love my dad and stuff like that. It'll be, yeah, caught a few fish. And it, it's getting the balance just right. And it's, that's yeah. the hardest part. A lot of fishermen get divorced because they don't spend enough time with the family. Yep. Uh, and, yeah, it, yep. it's scary. It really is. You've got to yeah. you've got to look after your missus and your kids. Of course. Yep. For, can you uh, stress that enough? Yep. Right. The, 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 
we, we've sort of like covered this one, but it's um, how did you get involved with um, CWC and Strike for how, how did you start the coalition? Where did it all start? Were it a conversation or well, a fishing? So Leif and Truman and I have been friends for a long time, really long time, going back to when I first started making lures. And um, uh, it, holistic, we've just been friends. We've kept talking about it for a long time and it just happened. I mean, I, I, I wish I had a big master plan that I could say, well, we decided to do this. Um, it was just, I think a number of years ago, I said, hey, Leif, we should do this. Yeah. Let's, 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 do, let's do the guppy. You know, of course me, I'm like, hey, we, you should make my lures for me. Um, but anyway. Um, we've just been friends. It made sense. Everything felt so right and natural to do a, co a collaboration together. Um, it's just one of those things. You know, I've fished with them before in the past. And, and it's worked from, it literally started, what came first, the guppy or the, the, the thought of making a lure with conjunction? Did, did you already have the lure in, in mind? You think, I'll tell you what, if we're going to do a, a lure, I've got an idea. It'll be this one. We'll call it the guppy. No, no, the guppy was already out there for quite a few years, and All the right, guppy okay. was probably my my most famous bait. Um, All right, okay. one of them, but that definitely is one that's my most famous. Has won a lot of tournaments, caught a lot of big fish. Um, yeah. It's just a really accessible bait to use because it works for everybody really easy, you know. And when we first started talking about making a line of True Glide lures uh, for Strike Pro CWC, yeah. there was we had a whole whole line of things that we went through. We tested out what do we want to do. The guppy was the first one I thought, let's start with the guppy. It makes sense. You know, yeah. CWC is, and at the time we did it, the funny thing is, um, like you had alluded to earlier, yeah. rubber baits were huge. People had stopped fishing hard baits. Yeah. And um, it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a gamble, I think they took, because, you know, just that was not the hot bait. Rubber, rubber, rubber was the hot bait, yeah. you know, plastic yeah. and stuff. Um, and so I thought, well, if we're going to do a, a resurgence of, of Jerk baits, which we everyone knows is going to come back. Everything's cyclical. I knew they were going to come back. Yeah, awesome. that'd be the right one. And it filled a niche that wasn't filled by the rest of their lineup. Like awesome. the Buster um, yeah. fishes a little bit up more, a little bit shallower. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a flat sider, freaking awesome, great, awesome bait. Awesome. Um, but we there was nothing really in the lineup that kind of filled the niche the guppy did. Yeah. So that made yeah. sense to drop it in. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's it's and it's done fantastic. Well, I know a group of lads that have got personal best at UK Pike. Oh, you awesome. must get pictures. You must see pictures all the time and think, wow, I'm so proud of that I'm behind that. Yeah, I, I do, actually. I get quite a few of them, and a lot of guys, of course, say, please don't share. <laughs> a couple yeah, of yeah, UK yeah. guys always say, don't don't share. But, um, yeah, it is really, really cool. It's, it's yeah, and especially lately, there have been some a lot caught yeah, this year. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a big fish year for the guppy. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is good. It's good. Like I say, the good thing is people buy them, so that makes my boss happy. And, yeah, and you know, friend happy. So that's, that's yeah, and they catch good. fish, so they're happy. So it's good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, it's all about catching fish, no matter what. You know, you, you expect us uh, to work at CWC. You're just going to push their products. I don't just use CWC products. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't do that. I'm, I, I use anything that will help me catch fish. But I know, for, you know, when, when I'm when I, in discussions with it all to do with CWC, you, yeah. It were like the dream, you know. It were like, yeah. You know, I'd I'd watched Pierre and and Truman and stuff like that, and you know, I'd, I'd had busters and stuff like that, and I'd, I'd and wolf, I'd done really well on wolf tails uh, and pig shads, you know. And I, I just I, I had a guppy obviously before I, I worked for CWC, and I was looking at these laws and just goes, they've just got it right, you know. There's yeah. Yeah. Some companies go off, you know, I see I see some other manufacturers. I'm not going to name them because it's it's unfair to name them. I see another other manufacturers mm -hmm. making. Buster copies. Oh yeah, there's quite a few, and they, can, and they can call them what they want. They're Buster copies. You know, mm -hmm. I can see them. There's thousands of them out there. They make a Buster copy. There's wolf tails out there. They make a wolf tail copy. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen anything close to a guppy copy yet, but there's no doubt there will be something. There's a up. couple. <laughs> there are some out there. Yeah. And, and, and to me, it's it's um because we are the first to do it. It's we're like our innovators, and it's so exciting. You know. Yeah. To be someone who's in charge in UK selling mini smokes is like yeah, right. it's a dream, you know. It, yeah. it, it it's fantastic. If only could make them quicker. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, <laughs> but that's, that's a big problem. problem. Yeah, yeah. We'll get them quicker. But uh, listen, they're going forward. I'm sure that'll all fall in place. I'm sure we've got some mini smokes coming in very very shortly. I think they're here in the next couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right. Two more questions, Joe. Then I'll let right. you get because it's probably about three o'clock in the morning over there now isn't it? what time is it over there now no no i'm good you're the one who's tired for me it's like oh, no, in the no, afternoon it's, it's not that late really um right um what boat do you currently have uh well I, it's funny i've got a couple boats okay. i'm an american so i got more than one boat um so i've got a ranger 
So I got okay. a Ranger, the, the brand I fish. Um, so Ranger 690. Um, yeah. Love it. Fast, low to the water. It's kind of a specialty boat that they don't make anymore. So they've now they're really in demand because they're they're probably the best, in my opinion, one of the best musky boats ever made. And yeah. so I've got a Ranger 690. That's my yeah. main big water boat. I can handle anything in it. Uh, and then my other boat is um, the kayak. Um, I've got a couple of friends who own a kayak company. And um, I, a couple of years ago, I thought I need to, I want to stay in shape and trying to think of ways to stay in shape. And I don't like working out. I can't run because I've screwed my knees up, right? Yeah. And um, yeah. I thought, well, if I got a kayak, I know I use yeah. it because I like fishing. And I, I live um, a couple of blocks away from a whole chain of lakes here in Minneapolis. So I'm, I'm right in the city, but there's yeah. these beautiful lakes with big muskies, big bass, big everything. And you can't have any um, motors in it except for electric. And so I can walk down the block, pop my kayak in, catch 40 big largemouth bass of, or catch some big muskies out of my kayak. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of my my way to stay in shape. The, the thing I didn't anticipate with the kayak is that I, I love it. It's like being it's like being a kid again. You know, you're in the yeah. water and you have limited yeah. electronics and. But one day I'm one. But oh. one day. Well, feel free is the kayak I'm using, man. They're amazing, and they're, they're musky guys, so that's why. It's so good. I mean, the, I mean, again, the weird thing about the UK is we're always about ten years behind the states, no yeah. matter what we do. Yeah. You know, um, we, it, it just to me, as all the time I've ever been a fisherman, especially a pike angler, we've yeah. always ten years behind the states, and yeah. then we're maybe about six years behind Sweden and and Scandinavia, and right. it's it, it hurts, you know, because you're seeing stuff that's coming in, like we've got the kayaks becoming a really big thing in the UK. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there selling specific fishing yeah. kayaks and yeah. they're doing trips out to different countries on kayaks. Yeah. And I've seen them come from the ones with us to like pedal power and electric engines up back. And it's I like- two kayaks. <laughs> I have a pedal kayak and I have yeah. a paddle kayak. So I guess three boats, but yeah. Good, you can, I mean, some of these kayaks now you can physically stand up and cast on these kayaks, can't you? And, oh. they're, and they're quite safe to do that. Yeah, 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 I've got, so my, um, my, my lure is the name of one of them, the paddle kayak, you can, I can stand all day, no problem. I'm standing all day and fish, and um, I can't move around too much, but I can stand yeah. and cast and I'm comfortable. And it's got a seat that feels like a recliner. I mean, it's so comfortable. And now my new one is, um, it's called the Big Fish. It's so cool, it's a paddle kayak. And it has higher sides. I can move around that one. The seat flips back, so you have a deck yeah. to walk around. I can stand on one side like I'm fishing off a boat, and it's just—I mean, yeah, it's stupid. It's so cool. Yeah, yeah, again, it's, again, it's making it for fishermen because the one thing I did notice when I was fishing in this kayak, and I can't remember what make it was, um, yeah. I felt I felt quite stable. Mm -hmm. You know, I wore a life jacket because obviously it's—I mean, we're only fishing on a canal, it's only quite shallow, but. Um, I wore a life jacket just because, you know, it's, yeah. it's not to wear life jackets. And I felt quite stable in it, but I felt if I turned around and give a big thump with a lure, that yeah. I, when, when I were a cub and a scout and when I were a young kid, we did Eskimo roll. You know Eskimo roll where you yep. turn over and I can mm -hmm. get back up. Of course. It, I remember it being really scary. And yeah. I never wanted to feel that feeling. And, and it only worried yeah. me a little bit. But when I see some of these big white kayaks that they're using now and they're going on like Lake District and they're going on some big waters and on sea, I think to yeah. myself, I wouldn't mind to give that a go. Like you say, it's a fantastic way of keeping fit. Yeah, it's a yeah. Really good and belly boats. Well, yeah, you know, it, it's yeah. it's good that everything's coming and it's making um, everybody more accessible. Let's face it, boats are expensive. Yeah, you know, right. boats stand for B B O A T break open another thousand for no reason. They're expensive yeah. people, get. and if you a kayak is a you know a quarter of the price yeah. and better than a ruby dinghy. I wish you we know, had them as a kid. Can you imagine if you had the access that these kids do? It's like, crazy. I wish I had. Same here. I mean, if I'd have started with a kayak and then moved on to a boat, I think it'd be better because you'd appreciate it a boat more. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if I don't you know, yeah, but I don't know. You know, like I went. You're, from, going, I've, you're going back. You're going from a boat onto a kayak now. Yeah, so. and I'm going from a good boat with you know mega imaging and like everything. I like you, know, you can't get more decked out. And um, yeah. I there's I appreciate both. I mean, there's yeah. like I appreciate both. I, I do the the kayak, like I said before, I really appreciate because uh, it's the intimacy and I can drop it in anywhere. You know, like to, uh, for example, tomorrow I've got two friends and we are, um, I have more than two, but two friends that like to fish high kayaks, uh, <laughs> I think. Um, so tomorrow there's a musky lake that is off limits to, you can't get on. It's private property everywhere around it. And the DNR uses this lake as, a, they used to use it as a broodstock lake to stock all of our lakes. And they stopped doing it years ago. 
but the rumors of there being huge fish in there and be able to catch a lot in one day have been rampant for years. And the only people who can get to this lake is when they go ice fish. And I know they've caught big muskies ice fishing and ice fishing for muskies isn't really a thing. You can't because the season ends December 1st. Yeah, and so, awesome. yeah. And so the water levels are high right now. And I found a creek that empties into this lake. And tomorrow this creek goes to a little road. I went on Google Earth, found the creek. We're going to drop our kayaks into the creek, paddle a mile up the creek into the lake and fish it. I could never do that, you know, on my big boat. The laws because you're joining the creek, so you're yep. not going under the land, so the water's yep. not on by the Yeah, because water in Minnesota is all public. If you can get on it, you're fine while you're on it. This is getting to it. And yep. so, yeah, so we're going to see how it goes. I'm going to videotape it. I'm going to actually do a YouTube video of that, too, I think. Just remember, you need to take a little bottle to have a wee in. So you, you can go what? to... You, you need to take a little bottle so you can have a wee. So you can <laughs> urinate. You don't want to be getting off and getting a wee and then getting shot. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. Just yeah. be careful. I don't want you in prison. You don't yeah, want to be in prison. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the last the last question I'm going to ask you is about basically Fish Finder. Uh, you know, are they cheating or are they literally the nuts? So we, we, we've sort of like covered that because yeah. you've got 360 imaging, which is a different level. They, they're such a big part of fishing nowadays, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I will say that it's like anything. I mean, you still have to catch the fish, right? I can't tell you the minute that you, you have side imaging on yours, the amount of times I've been fishing and I go, oh, there's one over there. <laughs> and throw a cast that that fish, yeah. Just a and, yeah. and I have caught one or two that way, but not, not that many. I will yeah. say in some respects, it's the best thing ever happened to fish. All I want to do is look at the stupid screen half the time. <laughs> you know, like, look how cool that is. Oh yeah, I should be fishing. I, I mean, I have spent more time, you know, the, the more advanced fish finders have got, the more I want to watch them. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you go past somewhere, especially like I say, when I go from Lawrence to Hummingbird, the thing for me is I'm going to go on that water. It's going to be like a completely different water because it's going to be the, it's going to be Hummingbirds. It's going to be the, the mega imaging's yeah. idea of what I think is. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? So it's going to yeah. be, I've seen it in Lawrence and thought, well, I know this. And then the, down there, there's a lock down there. And I, I don't know why I get caught down there. And I'm going to, show, I'm going to see it on this thing. I think, wow, that's that's yeah. what I've been seeing all the time. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm hopefully going to get it this week and get it fitted on boat by the end of this week. Cool. Because well, I will I'll put this out too. The, the interesting thing, I've been running the uh, mega imaging for a couple of years now. Yeah. yeah. And, and been fishing with some people who, you know, helped develop it. And they're, they're so good at it. Yeah. The interesting thing to me is, I'm the way I use it and they use it and the, you already know the spot. I'm yeah. going to a spot that's been good to me in the past, yeah. or I know it's a musky spot and I'm yeah. finding some new things there, but it already was a musky spot. I haven't really found that many new spots using it yet. I have okay. found some, but it's still that. Um, so as far as the cheating, I already yeah. knew these spots and I'm fishing them and I'm using it for that. I'm looking yeah. where on the spot that musky might be, or there might be something different or, you know, one of my favorite spots um, that I caught a ton of fish off over the years. Um, now I know why the fish are there. I always thought there was a spring or something like that in the summer. There's not. There's a bunch of boulders underneath the milfoil, which yeah. I, I didn't know because I don't bang jigs, the jigs or anything off of it. So I'm kind of learning more about the spots that I had already caught fish on. And so as far as cheating goes, you know, people are still saying it's cheating. It's not. I mean, you still got to catch the fish. And I mean, you still have to have that fisherman's instinct. Don't get me wrong. There's, there's watercraft's a big thing. You know, we in the UK before fish finders came along, everybody was watercraft. You know, everybody looked at a spot and thought that's going to hold pike. So imagine a lake, a, a, yeah. a big round lake, and uh, and both ends you've got an inlet and an outlet of a river. So it's, it starts with the river, ends in a river, goes yeah. either side. First two places are going to be best spots. is inlet and outlet. You know, right. that that's basic. But if you if when you get a fish finder on some of these spots and you see how, how that water carves out that lake bed yeah. and see how it runs in, in UK a lot of our water reservoirs are, are old villages. So they dam them at one end and then they fill it with water. Right. So and they never take anything out. So there'll be buildings down there and stuff. Now, obviously in America it's a really big thing where they'll dam like like areas and you'll be up trees underneath you never take the trees out you leave the trees in yeah, yeah i've yeah. seen that i've seen that quite a lot where trees oh, are still sure. stuck out of water mm -hmm. so you know as a lure angler and especially as someone who does a lot of trolling rather than casting i do a lot of casting don't get me wrong but i, I really enjoy trolling and covering a lot a lot of water in a day right. um i don't want to lose lures my right. my pet hate is losing lures so yeah. knowing what depths are underneath my boat mm -hmm. at any one time, and not only myself knowing that, but also my boat partner and telling them to lift the lowers up or to, yeah. you know, bring in line or lift your rod up in air, you're going to go over a tree or 
you know, and that to me is what makes a really good fisherman. That's how you learn the art of trolling. That's how you catch a lot, a lot of fish. Yesterday we had 50 fish to boat, over 50 fish to boat, a mixture of pike and perch, but it was, that's not a particularly good day. You know, I've done a lot more than that right. in a day and it wasn't a great day, you know, but we did catch a lot of fish. But that comes from years and years of doing it and knowing, mm -hmm. running weed lines and stuff, where, where the perch are going to be, where the pike are going to be on the weed yeah. lines. And, and I think a really good fish finder makes a fish a good fisherman better. Yeah. If you give it to somebody who's just started fishing, go, there you go, there's fish finder, go and catch some fish. It's going to show you hundreds of fish, go and tell me what them fish are catch. And and I think that's where that's where it's it's going to be really important to me. And that's that's and that's why I'm looking forward to it so much. Honestly, I can't wait for the weekend. Yeah. Unless unless my wife kills me or my baby that's due in a week and a half comes oh, really? early. Yeah, I've Number got a baby. 16. Congratulations. Imagine, just imagine if it turns I'm gonna I'm gonna get the fish finder built into the boat. Sunday morning, I'm going to get up and she's going to ring me up and say my waters are broken. I'm like, oh no, oh no. But you know it's like, going to happen. Uh, you know it's going to happen. You know it's going yeah. to happen. Yeah. yeah. So Good listen, Joe, that, that is literally, it's been unbelievable. I think we've been on for an hour and 38 minutes, for yeah. not mistake. Might be a little interlude in between where we had a bit of a technical issue. Uh, but listen, Joe, it, it's been absolutely fantastic, mate. It's not gone like I expected because I, I usually go through the 22 questions, but some of them are so non-specific. Because you are your own man, you are your own company, you're a consultant, it's made it slightly different, and, and I've really enjoyed it, especially the questions okay. by, you know, by lower guys, the, the guys who make lowers, because yeah. these are the guys that I've made the video for. So it's it's it, I think it'll work perfectly. Well, I, I appreciate it. It was super fun. So I appreciate Thank you taking you. time to interview me. Ple pleasure's all mine, Joe. Pleasure's all mine. Oh, um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to get off now and let you get some rest the, later on this afternoon. So I'm guessing it's about half past three in the afternoon now. It's about, uh, what are we at here? We're at four o'clock, so it's almost four o'clock. Yeah, four yeah. o'clock, so it's, it's uh, 10 o'clock here. So I'm going to sit down and watch some at soap operas, which don't get over there. So listen, enjoy your day's fishing tomorrow. Do not get caught poaching. <laughs> I, I don't want to stay in a prison. Or anything like being black and white bars down here. Yeah, right. I, I look good in black and white. Listen, look after yourself, Joe. I'll keep an eye out for you. I'll say I follow you on Instagram and, and on Facebook, so I'll keep an eye out and see what you catch tomorrow. All the best, mate. And uh, I'll too, see man. you next year. I'll see you next year at the show. Yep. Count on make, it. And good luck with the new baby. And line to get one of them true glides. Yeah, I'll I'll bring one for you for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, gentlemen. Listen, it's been a pleasure, Joe. Take care of yourself. All the best, you mate. Too, Bye, everybody. Take care. Joe Peter Summer. Honestly, what a race guy. Um, if you're a low fisherman, does it get much better than that? Does it honestly, honestly get much better than that? Only thing is it's absolutely boiling in this house and I've got all windows and stuff, stuff open, so I'm sweating making knackers off. Uh, right, so that's it. That's that one done. There's um, maybe one more to go. I wonder what that's going to be. I'll have to wait and see what, yeah. This has been Joe Peterson. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you soon. Tight lines.